Our Father, we give you praise. We give you thanks because this weekend we can understand your determination to kickstart this process of making in any life that until now has been floating. Holy Spirit, so we are sitting to yield our lives to the process. We ask you to help all the agitations of our heart. Cause our heart to accept whomever you may use to help our lives. However the man may be, is not important now. Let it just be your choice. We surrender to you absolutely. We ask you to do it in the name of Jesus. As we learn again this night, Holy Spirit, may you speak to us. You are the teacher. May you teach us in a way we will appreciate it more and better. Lord, that after now, every one of us will go back deeply persuaded that this process is indispensable. Deeply persuaded that this process is your only option and method for making men. Please, Lord, arise and do it in our hearts. Arise and impress it in our hearts. Anybody who has been unsure before now, let the matter become even clearer. Thank you, gracious God. We are praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. Let us read at verse 7 to verse 10. Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my way, and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house, and also charge, and also have charge of my courts, and I will grant you free access among the are standing, standing here. Now listen, Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you. Indeed, there are men who are symbol, who are a symbol. For behold, I am going to bring in my servant to the branch. For behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua. On one stone are seven eyes. Go, I will engrave an inscription on it, declare the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and under his tree. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, so we are going to see our yieldedness for the modeling. The need for us to yield and not struggle with the process. That if God wants to make a man, he requires the man to absolutely surrender and yield himself so he can make it. And what it means is that the man will be convinced in himself that this is what should be done. He will be convinced that it has no alternative. And let me say again that discipleship does not have an alternative. If anybody has been uh, speaking you into something else, it's either because he's not aware of what is correct, or he's deliberate as ruining your life. So let's see how God was introducing the matter here to Zechariah and uh, to the high priest Joshua. Zechariah was the one seeing the vision of discipleship. 
and it's important God also shows you so you can understand it. You know, on his own, he might not have uh, taken note of how God would like to make his men. They only return to build a house of God, to build a physical house. And the building was going on smoothly uh, with occasional distraction from Tobias and Sambalat and all the other enemies. It is possible to be occupied with that kind of thing and you're missing out on the real thing, which is discipleship. I don't know if you are getting ourselves. The real thing, which is discipleship. Joshua, the high priest, was meant to pay attention to this matter more than anything else. So the Lord brought Zechariah to see what ought to be, how men will be made uh, instruments of revival in something much more than building a physical house. Now look at, I will not be able to go back completely to the earlier verses, but just keep noting number one is that Joshua was perfected himself. The sin in his life was handled. God had to deal with that before he would be an instrument of discipleship. God had to do it. That's the first picture. But see what the Lord is now saying. He said, I will give you an access if you walk in my ways. Joshua will need to have an access to the presence of God to be able to do effective discipleship. He will be a man that has got access to the presence of God, to the power of God. Before he will be able to be an instrument of discipleship. And that is for the disciple now. But I'm not dealing with that. I'm dealing with the disciple. So he said, now listen, verse 8, Joshua the priest. You and the men that sit before you. We will need to look at that verse 8 very well. When a man is contented to experience discipleship, he will have to sit down before another man. He will have to sit. Praise the Lord. He will have to learn at somebody's feet. He will have to learn. That's the first point I'm looking at. So help me read that verse uh, 8 in other translations. Because what I'm noticing there is important to me. Let's read in King James or New King James and in other translations. Living Bible and Message Bible. Eh? Okay, New America. So the men are called friends, yeah? Friends. Friends who are sitting. Friends who are sitting. Discipleship requires men becoming friends and sitting down. <coughs> Praise the Lord. So listen, Joshua, you and the men who are sitting before you. You and your friends, some versions say colleagues. Let's see another translation with James. New or old? King James? Eh? Message? Believe in all you. So other priests 
other ministers. They have become ministers. But they were still sitting down. They did not say, ah, we have outgrown this. Any other translation? I need King James. Eh? Revised standard. Okay, read. Yeah, now, old Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men of good. Okay. Yeah, for they are men of good men. They are men of good sign. They are men of good omen, your friends, colleagues, co-ministers, who sit, I need King James now. Yes. Thou and I, fellows. All right, New King James. Yes. You and your companions. All right. Any other version? There's a version that says you and the men that sit before you. All right. So you'll be able to notice here that God is speaking about men or colleagues who are doing what? Sitting. So discipleship requires a sitting down. Sitting down. And that's the first thing we want to look at as a man uh, becomes contented to be a disciple. He must learn to sit. And to sit down is to be ready to learn, to assume a learner's posture. It's for a man to assume a learner's posture. And that is the first thing we are going to be discussing uh, at this moment. All the modeling we are talking about will only work when you are able to sit down. There are years of intensive sitting down. And much more than that, you need to be continual in sitting down. You shouldn't interrupt it. So I would like us to pray again that people who are sitting down have become men, friends, colleagues. People we are bringing to learn Christ are reliable people, men, colleagues, are not for us. Uh, it's when, you, when children are sitting down, baby believers, that after many years they are still childish, they will take nothing seriously. But when a man decides to sit down, is focused, is determined for something, and God is saying to us, pay attention. Joshua, you and the men who are sitting down before you. Can you read again? Read for me again that verse eight completely. Now listen. Yes. Joshua, the high priest. Yes. You and your friends who are sitting in front of you. Yes. Indeed, they are men who are a symbol for the whole. And I'm going to bring in my servant to the branch. They are a symbol. When men are sitting down, it's so they become a symbol of the branch that is coming. Read, read it for me in Living Bible like that. Read the Living Bible. Yes. Listen to me. Joshua the high priest. And all you other priests. You are illustrations of good things. You are illustrations of good things to come. So what we are waiting for can be illustrated now in our lives. Men sit down to come to a point they are called women, single signs, illustrations of what is to come. That's the target of sitting down. So you are sitting 
to become a model of this revival we're talking about. To have a life that uh, shows a revelation of what we are waiting for. So he says, Joshua, you and the priests, these men are illustrations of what is to come. We cannot miss this. We cannot miss this. Bind up the testimony and seal the teaching among my disciples, and I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the Lord from the house of Jacob, and I will look eagerly for him. Listen carefully, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders that will occur in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. We are illustrations of what God is saying. In this, we see another uh, description of manner of life that speaks about the future. The way we live is pointing men to the future. Praise the Lord. So Joshua was to take note of this. The revival they were waiting for was more than building a physical house. It will require grooming ministers to a life that speaks of the good thing that is to come. He said, For behold, the stone which I have set before you, Joshua, on that one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove wickedness and guilt of this land in one single day. You see how the Lord move to become effectual dealing with sin without much struggle. He said, in one single day I will terminate wickedness and sin on the land. Praise the Lord. When God has got man, revival will become effectual. Sin will be dealt with in the land. And in that day, declares the Lord, every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and under his fig tree. You see what, what is happening here? That men who have been discipled all go and press on pursuing the discipleship. Inviting men under their own fig tree and under their vine. Bringing men to come and sit. When you have been discipled, you will not be asking me, how do I start my own discipleship? God say you will invite your neighbors. Either by physical invitation, or even your life can send an invitation. Your life can send men to you again. They say they just want to visit you, that they have been seeing you, but they decided to come and pay you a visit. Will you take that visit for granted? Eh? No. It will be an opportunity to bring a man. To what? To sit under to bring a man to come and sit under, under. I don't know if you're getting me. To bring a man to come and sit under. Please note in verse 10 again that the same sitting you saw in verse 8 is still the process. It's not after you have been discipled, you say, well, it was good for me, but it's not necessary for another person. No, 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 no. It will still be the instrument of discipleship, of discipleship. Helping men to do what? To sit under your victory and your vine. Helping men to come and sit. And let me tell us, some people are hanging around. They are refusing to sit. 
they have so many reasons to justify they are not sitting down to learn in discipleship. They blame it on being busy with this and that. They, you cannot be transformed if you don't sit down. Some are busy with uh, their ministry. But look at God speaking to priests. Say, even you priests, this message is for you. Hallelujah. This message is for you. You need to come and sit under. Any man the Lord brings your way, even if he's a bishop of a diocese, the best way to help him is to derobe him. You come and sit down. If he refuses to sit down, if he wants to do a big man discipleship, he will not succeed. He will, he will have to be derobed and sit down. Where? Under your roof. You will have to sit there. Don't say, eh, I'm going to teach him in his office. Well, if you are going to his office, he has not started the service. You are still trying to create awareness. So you can do that, hoping that he will take a step to sit down. If you see a young man who is uh, already becoming drawn into ministry, and said, I have a call of God, that call must make him to do what? Sit down again under your roof. Praise the Lord. Are we together now? Eh? Not everybody likes to sit down. When you are sitting down, it puts you into obliviousness. It puts you out of recognition. Even smaller boys, you will see them that are already powering. They are already powering everywhere. Eh? People are already respecting them as great ministers of gospel. But God is requiring you to sit. Not in passivism, but in active learning. Learning a man's life and uh, through it learning the life of the Lord. That's what we are brought into. Let me note again that a man who has not been discipled will not be able to disciple another person. I have seen people now, they've all started what they call discipleship ministry. You know, he, at a point, he became an anything in the last decade. It became something that some well meaning brothers had to start, and they were doing it from good intention, actually. And all they want is they are troubled about the level of decadence and corruption in the church. So they want to gather young believers and help them. You know what they are doing is with good intention, but it will not be effectual, it will not succeed, because nobody has sat on them. So when your discipleship is such that you are avoiding the hammer from getting to your own life, you are avoiding sitting under, you attend only open meetings, and your life is still covered in an enclosure, and nobody has been able to uh, put a finger in your life. It will be very difficult for you to know how to help others. And the truth is that there will be many people that will come seeking for help. They will come asking, how can you help us? I don't know if you're getting me. Eh? If you're sincere, you will quickly discover that you are incapable of helping anybody. Are you getting me? You are incapable. Someone has told me that he would be able to minister to these men and they will be born again. But after they are born again, he doesn't know what to do for them again. He doesn't know how to help them again. But now they are born again. How will I be able to help them? And he's a minister. 
and it was taking time to make him understand that this uh, discipleship is not ministry of your child. It's the ministry. I don't know if I get it. It's the ministry. You are like a man who goes to the bush to kill an animal. When you come back, what must you do to that animal? You must process it. You must roast it. Is it not? And if you don't do that, that animal will decay and produce foul smells. For you to be able to be that effective, you yourself must decide to sit down. So when a man is sitting down, it's a time of intensive learning first. It's a time he's under supervision, that his life is supervised. It's a time of obscurity, and people will also misunderstand it. Even Mary was misunderstood by her own sister, who was like, why won't you come? Let God has to speak to you. He say, Master, speak to my sister. Tell her to do what? To come and serve with me. It looked as if God was not speaking to men. And Martha was praying. He said, may God speak to Mary so that she will come and serve with me. When people misunderstand and say, you are not hearing God, and that is why you are unable to arise and serve with me. But Mary felt the right choice was to sit at his feet. At whose feet? The feet of Jesus. The feet of the human Jesus. Her relationship with Jesus was the relationship of a human being to a human being. It's not a relationship with God. Are you, are you getting me? Because some people say, well, uh, Jesus was uh, Mary's disciple, so Jesus is my disciple. I don't know if you're getting me. Jesus came as a human being. And his human element was put into use in discipling men. He came as a human to relate with men and disciple them. He did not relate with them as God. Praise the Lord. Imagine that even Peter could rebuke him. Could Peter rebuke God? Eh? Peter called him and rebuked him, said, Stop doing that kind of thing. Don't do it again. Uh -uh. And the Bible says, And Peter took him. See the way he takes somebody. Maybe he held his hand, took him by the side, and began to rebuke him. Because he understood the human Jesus. Praise the Lord. He understood the human Jesus. He understood Jesus as a prophet. So he had the right to rebuke him. He operated just as a prophet. And when he died, he began to operate as a priest. And when he comes, he will operate like a king. So he keeps him my prophet, priest, and king. The most hymns to say. But he was just living like a prophet. So discipleship requires human to human interaction. Let's not lose sight of discipleship. Every one of you, every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit. Everyone, none is exempted. 
every one of you will invite his neighbor. Every one of you will invite his neighbor. Are you included? Are you going to become a disciple? You are not even talking to me. Are you going to become a disciple maker? Yes. Are you getting me? You will say, well, I'm just a disciple. I don't want to make anybody now. Now, yes. But in the future, you must make disciples. When you have been made, you yourself will make disciples. <clears throat> so, the Lord says, in that day, everyone, nobody is exempted in this. Because discipleship can be demanding and tasking and costly. So many don't want to get involved. They prefer to be itinerant preachers. Just inviting them from place to place and they will preach in those meetings. After preaching, they will go back, maybe properly taken care of, but they don't understand what we give God, his desired intention. All those you are running around will be useless unless you have a disciple who is there that will continue the level you have opened up. That as many as are willing to be disciples, there are people who are there that will continue disciple making. Otherwise, you may just be going around. Once in a while, it, it may be that the bullet will shoot somebody who will start actively searching for help. But such gains are small. So I'm talking to you. I'm begging you to do what? To focus on discipleship. Focus on inviting men under the roof of your house. Discipleship is done in the house, Abby. It's not done in the church meeting. The church meeting is too big for discipleship. And if anybody meets you in the church, I don't know how it happens, but there is an automatic holy sentiment that he has been. The person will become a special sister. So you see a sister, you say that sister is wonderful. She has testimony, and you are being given the testimony of somebody you have never lived with. You know you are a to yourself. You can never know somebody when you have not lived with that person. I don't know if you're getting it. When somebody comes to my house, so I can pretend for six months, one year, two years. So you can put a probation period and be waiting until the day she comes out to be herself or himself. And I say, now that I know you, so we can start discipleship. Otherwise, you have not been a disciple. You have only really been uh, trying to package yourself to impress me that you are a good sister or a good brother. It is an unintentional thing. I don't know if you're getting me. It's not doing it deliberately. Only few can be deliberate about their own. Those are insecure people. But for others, there is always a desire to do well and pretend to do well. I don't know if you're getting me. But when you start staying, you know how she gets angry? You know how he eats? You know whether the food you cook is the type you want? You know whether he will sneak out to go and buy something and clean his heart? And eat, and you will not know. You know whether he wakes up to scrub the house? Eh? Or he can throw his boxer on the floor and uh, his Bible the other side, his shoe the other side, everywhere is scattered in that house. But when you see him dress in his suit and come out to give to lead in song or to moderate prayer meeting, ah, he thought he's an angel in a man. But when you bring him close, 
you know that he's willing to live in a dirty toilet, use a dirty toilet. He will now stand on the and do the toilet, or he will buy a bucket and pull into the bucket and flush. And that is somebody you are bringing for me, an irresponsible person. So when you bring people home, you begin to know them. Eh? I don't know if you're getting me. Mm. You begin to know them. Maybe you are the only daughter, and your father can buy a clothes, 50,000 naira worth of one clothes for you. And that's the kind of life you have been brought into. So even when you are your disciple, class, the man is always calling, hey, hey, princess, come on, come on, are you feeling? Are you okay? Are you comfortable? The man is digging a hole for you to fall. Somebody will be able to cut you off from him. I'll be able to teach you to buy skate 200 naira. And we are scared 200 naira. Praise the Lord. Somebody will be able to say, uh, give me your ATM card. And then we'll join your investment. Then you under the roof of somebody. Do you think it is a sweet experience? It can never be a sweet one. But it's going to help. Somebody will teach you how to give accounts because you have learned to sit down. And brethren, this is a must for everyone. If there were to be an exemption, we could have been missing. But nobody will come into ministry without this process. Let me ask you though to help anybody who is not sitting down. Some people will come right in your house and say, I have a program somewhere. I'm preaching in Ottawa. I'm preaching in Enugu next week. I say you cancel all your programs. You need to sit down. What, what do you even know? What are, what are you telling them? They say, well, it's the small I know, the little I know, but I think God is helping me too. I say, don't know that little again. Go and sit down and let God stop helping you like that. Let God help your life first before he starts helping your ministry. But that's someone who still tells you lies and yet is preaching. I don't know if we are together now. Are we together? Every man that we serve God must go under a roof. He must go under a roof. He must be meant to sit under your vine and under your feet. However rough is the process is, it will not be waived for anybody. Praise the Lord. So Joshua the high priest was to have this in his mind. He should not lose sight of this as the ministry he had returned to do. Why is the Rubabel the governor? was busy uh, building the house as a governor and Jeremiah, sorry, Zechariah and Haggai we are prophesying bringing the word of God and direction the priest the high priest Joshua must concentrate on making the priest to sit down praise the Lord Jesus wanted to help me. He told disciples, make them sit down. Make them sit down first. And they, they sat on the grasses in their fifties. They sat in their fifties. So they will not become too much for anybody to attend to. So discipleship is not a very big activity. Maybe if I'm handling just fifty. And you are handling 50, you are handling 50, and you are handling 50, and like that, it continues over and over again. 
will be able to raise men who will take over the responsibility, multiply them with their duties again. It continues, revival continues. Praise the Lord. So sitting down is one. One brother came to me in 2007, I think so, 2007, and told me he wanted to be disciple. I said, no problem. We will help you. And we began to discuss. His testimony is that he's, he's the president of this, he's the president of that. He had like either four or five leadership uh, commitments in SU, in the local church, in their town, brethren group. He mentioned all of that. Well, I told him, the first thing to do is to go and resign from all of them. When you have resigned, you will come back, you will not start. Ah. He felt that was too harsh. And I didn't see him again. The next time I saw him, he was already a reverend and had impregnated a girl. He had a dog in another state, paying for house rent there for her. So that nobody knew. Really. And he opened up and told me what was happening. I said, Well, that will become a permanent dent on your life. There's nothing you will do about it. And other things that came up, and so on and so forth. His life had been dented. I don't know if you're getting it. Because he refused to sit down. Especially these brothers who can sing very well, you know? They become celebrities in God's so Do we need celebrities? They become celebrities in God's work. And we are celebrating those who were struggling with sin. How will that work? So let me uh, charge us, anytime anybody comes, don't be, don't uh, begin to waive the requirements. Anybody that wants to be, are you getting me? Must see that. Even if the man is angry, he said, I'm already a bishop. And you're telling me, he said, Bishop must sit down. The bishop refuses to sit down. It's a matter of time. His ministry will close if he ever had one. All those noises he's making will come to an end. So if you meet a bishop and bishop is saying, Bro, Victor, we know your ministry. People have been giving account of the ministry. And uh, we want you to help us. He said, ah, who will I help? Is it your diocese or yourself? If he says it's myself, I want to be helped. He said, Bishop, will you be able to sit down and strip yourself of the paraphernalia of office and become a learner? You know, paraphernalia gives a man false perception of himself. But somebody must sit down to learn. Don't say these are big, big fishes. Big fish inside. There's no big fish inside. I don't know if you're getting me. There's no big fish. Don't compromise the standard. Test. Well, you must sit down. If you're willing, no. uh, this, don't be guilty. Say uh, it's like an discouraging man. Discipleship is where you discourage a man until he insists on, go, on going. It's not like uh, when you are telling somebody to be born again, you are begging, crying, asking the person to be born again. But once the person says, I want to be a disciple, you introduce the terms. You, you, you must be acquainted with the terms and accept them. If he says no, is there a problem? Do you think you have lost anything? You've not lost anybody. That he's a bishop has not given him a better asset in God's program than this brother who is not even a priest. The man that may bring revival, maybe this brother 
He had just he would just come and quietly learn and listen. And nobody knows his name. He's not on any poster of activity. Nobody has ever introduced him as a man of God. And you think, well, this one is not anybody. You will be amazed. When the Lord will make up his jewels, he's searching a heart. And he discovers that is this man you use. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So sitting down to learn. It is a requirement for teaching in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Let me show you that requirement applied. Applied. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Read chapter 4, the last verse, verse 25, so you will have a contest. And then 5, 1 and 2. Chapter 4, verse 25, and 5, 1 and 2. Okay. He saw a crowd, a large crowd, that were coming, following him. You know what they wanted now? They came from the Capolis, from Galilee and Jerusalem and Judea and the other side of the Jordan. This crowd was so much, they couldn't give us their number. They were so much. And Jesus knew how to handle a crowd, to introduce discipleship. Abby? So he introduced the mountain. He climbed the mountain and sat down. And the disciples came to him. And when he was set, he began to teach them. He opened his mouth and spoke to them. And that is still the way God handles men when they come. There must be a point he's sitting down with them helping their lives, bringing them away from the crowd. The desire of the crowd is material, physical. They wanted miracles. They wanted uh, signs and wonders. They wanted something powerful to happen. They paid their fare, crossing Jordan in their sheep, all to come and see if this man will do great signs and wonders for them again. That's why they came. And the Lord will not be deceived. He was focused on getting men who will sit down. You know, you don't need to quarrel with the crowd here. There were too many. If you are saying, let me tell you, if you want to follow me, <laughs> They were too noisy. They will say, We are following you. What are you saying? Can't you see us? We are here already. No problem. All Jesus needed to do was to go to the mountain. And the crowd will say, You go to a little. We are here waiting. We cannot come to the mountain. When you come down, we continue asking for what we are asking for. Praise the Lord. Getting men to sit. So our desire is that you will begin to sit down. Making it an intentional thing. Finding out time to pursue a one-on-one. Creating a better interaction. Breaking all the walls in your relationship with your disciple. There is no ministry outside of this. Other things are works of ministry and not ministry in themselves.
Do it for me, Ephesians 4. From verse 7. Yes, from verse 7. That to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive the host of cats. What, what is Christ's gift? So we can leave it and move. What is Christ's gift? The man. I don't know if you're getting me. So it's not a gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of God is Christ. The gift of Christ is man. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the ones you know, the charismata. So according to the measure of Christ's gift, a way of transfer of grace to our lives is through the instrument of man who our lives must sit under. As you sit with a man consistently, I can tell you, transfer of grace takes place. You begin to operate in the same grace of the man. You begin to enjoy the same uh, provisions of God as he does. Continue verse 8. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive with a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He, he who descended is himself, also he who ascended far above all the heavens. So that he might feel all things. And he gave some apostles. So that he might feel all things. What does he mean to feel all things? To replenish the earth. Is it not? To replenish the earth with man. What heaven's intention is to replenish the earth. And brethren, that work is possible through discipleship labor. And I'm inviting you to become keen and focused on that discipleship labor. Don't pursue the kind of ministry where you are one superman and they will just invite you and you do and say there are happy people here that will follow that power. Let it move now. And then so after falling, what has happened? What has happened? I don't know if you're getting it. So we keep on wasting our time. Our Christianity has lost bearing. It has lost bearing. About 30 years ago or more. The church was known for holiness, and rapture was the focus. People were groomed to be righteous and blameless. That the wicked will have nothing bad to say of them. But this is not the focus here. The focus here is life of your enemies, prosperity, is it not? And the pursuit of demons. That's what we will take in the new trend in ministry. And I can tell you, it robbed the church of this provision of God to bring men of grace. So we now have graceless men who are coming up to become ministers. We now have a pastor that is Oga, the, the, the lead pastor is just managing him. Eh? He's just managing him because his story is bad. Not. We now have pastors who are in business, and they will tell you that they are doing business, that the work of God is a business. Mm-hmm. That is what is happening. So they are looking for money. We need to be careful with such kind of thing. Focus on producing men of grace through discipleship. Continue. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until all attain to the unity. So their aim is simple, is simple. Why is a man made an apostle? 
to build up the church of God, to equip the saints and prepare them for the work of ministry. That is why. So you are not made an apostle to begin to tell us about how you were able to stop a star that was moving. And God took him by 12 midnight and you saw the star. And God said, watch it and stop it. You know that's what people are doing. They go say, go to that junction where there are four roads meeting in one. And you look up and see a star. That, you know stars do something like moving. I don't know what it is. But if you follow, you will see something like movement of stars. Even old women in the village, they all know about it. And somebody is busy finding his own calling in stopping stars. I don't know if you're getting me. He said that, and he'll be bragging that the Lord woke me up by 1 a.m. and asked me to, and I called my driver. My driver was like, how? Say, I'm obeying God. <laughs> hey, be very careful with all this. The goal of ministry has been lost in that. And why was he lost? Because the man never sat down himself. If you see a child that came from a home where he was never trained, nobody has forced him. Eh? They will have to move as crop toilets, crop bits, very well, and make it look white. Even if you become a dad, will you do it? You won't do it. And you won't be able to teach another person what to do. So if you see a child who has never been taught, cannot teach anybody. The church is set on this dynamic phenomenon of building believers, equipping the saints, equipping them. And I can be sure it will not take place in the same church of the church meeting. I you me? They come in the church and we preach and preach and preach. If that preaching could not successfully decentralize men to pursue under a victory and bind, it will not succeed. To equip them for the work of ministry. Continue. Until we all attain to the unity of the, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to be a mature man, to the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of fortune. By the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheme. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head. What does it mean to grow into him? To grow into Jesus. What does it mean? Yes, to become Jesus, another Jesus on earth. That's what God is targeting. To make us become another Jesus on earth. To grow into him. Who is the head? Christ. From whom the whole body joined and knitted firmly together by what every joint supplies. The church will grow and become another expression of Christ on earth. That's God's target. That you will not. Does Jesus commit immorality? Does Jesus steal? So why is it that a treasurer and pastor can go dive and steal the church dry? Eh? It's happening now. It's very common. Let me tell you that if they are doing election into the parochial church committee, the campaign is so much of who will be the people's word. 
because it's a, a signatory to the account. And why are they doing that? If they can convince the reverend, they will be eating. They will be sharing the church money. And it's even worse in Pentecostals where the one man is in charge of that money. Or, the, or every money goes to GS. I don't know if you're getting me. So let's pray and trust the Lord to give us a focus. Gradually, the church is losing a focus. Ministry of the church now has been overtaken by materialistic projects. They have lost their aim. And what we are trying to do is that God will help us bring men to the right focus. So we will not lose our bearing also. Praise the Lord. So the first matter of sitting, sitting must be clear in our hearts. Let me ask you now, are you sitting down? Are you consciously provoking a learning relationship? Number two is staying close. The second element of a yielded man is staying close. Closeness is important. That attitude must define who will be a disciple and who will, do, who will just be a passerby. John chapter 1 verse 35 to 42. Read for me again in New King James. John 1:35 to 42. Yes. What do you seek? They say to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when I said the teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where they were staying. And I remained with him that day. Now, it was about 10 hours. One of the two who had John speak and told me was angry. He first found the strong brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated as the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah, you shall be called the Christ, which is translated as the Christ. Okay, praise the Lord. So, staying close is what we are looking at here. Don't be stay far. Don't allow your ephemeral pursuit to place you far away from your discipleship. This man met Jesus. They believed the testimony of John that this is the Lamb of God. So they came to know who he was. And as they were following, Jesus asked them, What do you seek? What should be the answer to that? If somebody asks you, what do you seek? What do you want? What should be the answer? You should say what you want. Now. Maybe you say, I want to be a disciple. Is it not? I want to follow you. I want to prove that you are the Lamb of God or something. That must be an answer. But what was their own answer? Eh? Another question came by saying, Where do you stay? Where do we let down? What does that suggest to us? A quest for closeness, a desire 
not just to meet the master outside, but to follow him home. The instrument of closeness is fostered in this manner. As we come home, they decided that they wanted to be home with Jesus. So they came and followed him. And saw where he was staying. Almost all the gospel writers had to make a comment on this desire to know his house. And these we are married men. chapter 6 from verse 12 chapter 3 we bring it out better verse 20 19 and 20 19 says and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him and he came home and the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal ok it's ok Read in King James, verse 20, 19 and 20 also. Mark 3, 19 and 20. Mark 3, 19 and 20. And Judas is who also betrayed him. And then they went into a house. Okay. Then the one who came So the New King James is making it clearer. They went into a house. That is Jesus' house at Capernaum. That's how he brought them close. Didn't carry too many people at the time. He had only 12 disciples with him. So there were disciples he handled on the mountain, and there were disciples he brought home, who would become the apostles. He lived with them. Why was he doing that? Because of the responsibility they will undertake in the future. He needed to get them closely impacted. That's how God raises them. He doesn't keep them at a far. He brings them close. So you'll be asking yourself, how close am I in my own discipleship? Close her by. Are you far away? He brought them close and they went into a house. And it's a matter of time. Apart from Judas. Who became a traitor. Others 
we are a huge success. No matter what they were at the beginning, Simon, whom he called Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, he gave the name Bonages, sons of thunder. They were all difficult people. Simon was an inconsistent person. He had no loyalty. He can shout, 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 shout. When the thing comes, he will sneak back. James and John were sons of thunder. But God was going to make John the greatest teacher of love in the New Testament after Jesus. In the house, Philip, Bartholomew, or Nathaniel, even Matthew, the tax collector. And Thomas, the argument man, the person that will never believe anything. He was in the same room with them. And I know they will be arguing a lot. Simon the Zealot will not agree with, uh, he will never, never, never agree with uh, Matthew. He will call Matthew Sabo. It's like bringing a pub, a pub and APC <laughs> persons in the same house. That's the way they are. The Zealots, the Zealots were like I pubs who were protesting the Roman maltreatment. And uh, Matthew was a co- yes. He was working for that government. But they are going to be in the same house. And God will change them to become apostles. Men whose lives bear a special message. And Judas was there, still stealing. He was still stealing. It's possible John, who knew about his activities, we protesting. God, why did you, or oh Master, why did you bring this man with us? He's a thief. That which was not handled in his life became a weak, a soft point for the enemy to use him to betray his master at the cost of money. So you can be in a house. But your disciple is always pointing at something. And you refuse. You keep thinking your disciple is a, he doesn't understand this aspect. You know the day Mary was pouring her uh, costly ointment that Judas immediately calculated the money. Immediately and told you what the value would be. I said he would have sold it and would have used it to help the poor. I don't know if you're getting me. It's not that he loves the poor. John said it's not because he loves the poor, but because he's a thief, a pilferer, waiting, let money keep entering the purse. When you see some people working hard for money to be in the church account, it's not because they love the church. It's because they need something to steal. I don't know if you're getting me. That's how Judas was. So in the house, allow your life to be helped. Others became apostles. Judas own. Apostle by name. But by life, he was not one. Will he blame anybody that he wasn't given enough opportunity? He will not. He had opportunity that Matthias did not have. Barnabas did not have. And yet Barnabas, Stephen, the Philip, they were powerful brothers. But the Lord did not give them the privilege of coming to live with him in his house. 
Praise the Lord. And Judas lost his own privilege. Where dwell us now? Where do you live? As that question keeps coming to our mind, it has multifaceted implications. But for us, this moment is to foster closeness. Don't stay away as a disciple. And don't be a Judas in discipleship. Don't come and you are trying to, inside discipleship, you are trying to steal money from somebody, dupe somebody. You are planning to relay some girls in discipleship. You're making every effort to cause crisis. And you are in discipleship. The third element is the element of submission. So I have handled all the three. It's the sitting down, the staying close, and submission. They are very important elements in discipleship. Submission requires a man to come under a yoke. Human being is naturally not submissive. But there should be a yoke on your neck to enable you to be effective in discipleship. And what is the yoke? What is the yoke? That God has ordained that we must come under. What is the yoke? Eh? What is the yoke that a man must wear in order to be a disciple? Let me read First Timothy chapter six, one to three. You may read for me, chapter six, one to three. as bond servants, as slaves. Replace that slaves for our study now as disciples or learners. The slaves were uh, master servants in the olden days who may have been bought. And God is showing them how to operate as slaves in the house of God. But what is uh, common in both the life of a slave and the disciple is the yoke. A disciple puts on yoke, he wears a yoke with the master. And the essence of that yoke is so that he will be able to come and remain under the submission, under the master's training and submission. The yoke is the instrument. Until you have committed yourself without going back to be drawn, to be drawn by your disciple, to be taken along that you have lost your own personal uh, agenda and now you are drawn, you are taken along by your disciple. When you are able to do that, something happens. Those who are under the yoke as servants or disciples are to regard their own masters worthy of honor and respect and respect so that the name of God will not be spoken against. So, you see a learner, you see a master. And what joins a disciple to the master is the yoke and implement of connecting a learner to a trainer to help him learn and be exercised in the life and activities of the trainer.
people who you do agri in the local way, we know that animals are yoked together to farm. But there is one of the two animals that is a more experienced animal. And once you yoke him with the young animal, the young animal loses control of what he wanted. He must submit. If he doesn't submit, he will be injured. That yoke will break his neck. Once, if you see animal that take him to yoke, he will be crying. He will be struggling. Because he knows the implication of that yoke. So let me ask you, are you under a yoke? Or you are doing a yokeless discipleship, if there is something like that? A discipleship that has no yoke. A discipleship that has no submission. I've seen disciples whose uh, method is to come and tell you what they are doing. When you finish, I will say thank you for informing me. May God help you. You see, KO, what you are doing. You know, it's different from when somebody wants to discuss something with you. I say, okay, let's pray together about it. I hope you know teaching a man to pray for something is an important uh, element in breaking into God's will. So many people don't pray about anything. They may leave their house and go to office. From office, they have caught another vision. And the way they will present it, even with fallacies telling you that I felt God spoke to my heart. That is a yokeless discipleship. This is how a man is taken along Intensively, it's going to be difficult in the beginning, but with time, even the learner animal has learned. It becomes easy for it. It's no more an issue. It's no more struggling. It becomes a co-worker with the trainer. Praise the Lord. So don't protest against the yoke. So the name of God will not be put to shame. If anyone teaches something different and doesn't agree with these sound words of Jesus Christ and with the doctrine which is in agreement with godliness, he is conceited, as verse 4, and woefully ignorant, understanding nothing. He has a morbid interest in controversial issues. If any man teaches any other thing outside this yoke, he's a proud man. And no proud man can be on a yoke. Are you proud? Are you conceited? Does it look too difficult for you to submit for guidance? Do you want to make your own mistakes first before you seek to be guided? Hosea chapter 10, verse 11. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh out the grain. But we come over the hafenek with a heavy yoke for hard work. I will harness Ephraim and Judah will plow, and Jacob will hallow, hallow, and rake for himself. Another translation, verse 11. The neck that God will use must be fair. And God is 
looking for a well-taught person. A disciple can be well-taught like Timothy, but he has not been brought to yoke. He has been a general disciple and not a particular disciple under anybody. He has believed in the general concepts. He is intentionally trying to live right. But for him to be harnessed, what does it mean to harness? To unlock your hidden potentials. For him to be harnessed, God said, I will target that fair neck. Read King James for me, verse 11. Hosea 10, 11. You can read no King James. Somebody get the old one too. So Ephraim, the problem with Ephraim is his target is stretching the corn. He's stretching the corn. But he has not plowed yet. Do you understand that? People who enjoy threshing say, don't muzzle an ox when it is threshing. So he can eat. A worker deserves his wage. Ephraim was like that. But God said, ah, I want to put a yoke on his neck so that I will draw him to do what? To plow. To break his land first. That's what discipleship will achieve first in a man's life. Old King James. At the stop. A helper that is taught. Who doesn't love to treasure out the corn? Is it not sweet? How can a man go to the extent of exercising something that looks at apostolic ministry? Something that is as big as uh, the grateful food ministry. That's what he wants to be doing. You know the way people grow. We also grew like that. When you're born again, they say, what is your ministry? I don't know if you understand that. Eh? If you know how to shout, they say you're an evangelist. But what if my, your voice is more like my voice? So you're not an evangelist. I don't know if you're getting me. Eh? If you are always uh, in the Bible, so they say you're a teacher. If you have a gift of prophesying, they say you're a prophet. So in the fellowship, you see that we have got prophets. We have got uh, apostles. Some people are also saying they're apostles. Are you getting me? They will present themselves as apostles. If you go out now, tomorrow morning, and go around go down and enter all the streets there you will keep seeing apostles apostles and those people who are apostles are very young people very small people who have never been under you the message i'm bringing here is that for a man to become a treasure he has to first of all come under a yoke so that his neck is Fair neck be handled. Message amplified. How does God bring a man to yoke? Amplified. Nobody has amplified. Why eh? say I will set a rider on him? Who is a rider? Eh? No, who is a rider? If you set rider over this girl now, what does he mean? That somebody is riding her life. Do you like somebody to ride you? To dictate for you? Eh? Do you like somebody to dictate for you? Eh, answer me now. That God sets a rider over you. Have you seen uh, Amplified? Or 
you are really amplified. If cream indeed is a helper, broken and loving to trade out the cream. But I have a rental for I have spared him here to fall. Until now, I have spared him. Okay? I will now set a rider. I will now him. set a rider upon him. And make him draw. Okay, it's okay. I will now set a rider. So I'm asking you, is this something you like? That God will set someone to ride you. Answer me, please. Who wants someone to ride you? You get your own brain now. And God is speaking of a rider. That's you. Let's settle it. Here. Do you want somebody to ride you? This quietness is not good. You are saying no. Only you say no. Everybody likes his independence. Are you the only one God is speaking to? Why will you be riding me? You know that is the beginning of every rebellion. God does not does God not also speak to us? I hope you know that is the beginning of rebellion. Are you the only one God is speaking to? Miriam and Aaron said it. The Korah also said, Are you the only one? We are all holy. That's how rebellion starts. God said, I want to set a rider over your life. Can somebody help us with that? What does it mean? Yeah? Have you seen a horse? Who is that means where the horse will go? Is a rider. How does it mean it? Weeping. If you whip somebody every day. So I don't want you to go this way. Try to change. That's how the rider behaves. Let me ask first. Do you think this discipleship thing is something sweet? Let me ask you a second question. Are you ready for it? Is it a hard saying now? That we need to go back and check. If a man has a contrary opinion to this, he's conceited, he's proud. Why did God choose to set a rider? Doesn't he have any other way to do it? So we need to beg the Lord to do what? To set a rider upon us. That is the yoke. If a man's life is not under a rider, he will be jumping up and down anywhere he wanted. And for God to trust you, you must set a rider over your life. All right, read Job 39 for me, from verse 9 to 12. From verse 9. you find the wild ox in the field of the books, or will he harrow? Will you trust him because his strength is great and leave your neighbor to him? Will you have faith in him that he will return your grain and gather it from your threshing floor? Okay, so what do we discover there? Verse 19. Read verse 19. Yes. It says, Do you give the horse his height? Do you clothe his neck with the rain? Continue. Do you make him live like a locust? His majestic snorting is 
terrible. He calls in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. He laughs at fear and is not dismayed. And he does not stop back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him. The flashing spear and javelin. With shaking and rage, he races over the ground. And he does not stand. He does not stand still at the voice of the trumpet. As often as the trumpet sounds, he says, Aha! And he sends the battle from afar. And the thunder of the captains of the war cry. Okay, now look at verse 24, 23. The quiver rattles against him, as do the flashing spear and the lance of his rider. The lance of his rider. That lance is a lance of his rider. The first element talked about the unicorn. And God is saying, will you, will it be willing to serve you and remain beside your manger at night? Or can you bind the wild horse with a harness to plow in the furrow? There is, in verse 10, an element of yoke there with a harness. Will you trust him because his strength is great and leave your labor to him? If a man is still wide, in discipleship, the wideness is addressed and is the yoke that makes it possible. Let me say again that until the yoke comes, God will not trust us with his labor. We will not be trusted by God. Will you have faith and depend on him to return your grain and gather it from your threshing floor, the wide unicorn? The problem there is that wide ox, wideness in the ox. And the strength is great. But before it is put into use, it has to go under a yoke to domesticate it. Now, what does the yoke achieve? It makes a man to lose autonomy or independence. It helps to domesticate one. It brings a man under learning. Put, your, put my yoke upon you and learn of me. The learning that makes a man find a second rest and you will find the rest for yourself. I don't know if you are seeing that. That's what the yoke does. The yoke helps to train your shoulders and make you strong to be a responsibility. Before a man will carry burden, he must be under a yoke. My yoke is easy and then my burden is light. If the yoke is effectual and easy for you, it prepares you to bear the light burden. But if the yoke was not possible. You run off with the yoke, the burden will be too heavy for you because your neck muscles are not trained. If you see how people train their shoulder muscles and their arm muscles to be able to carry weight. I've seen a man carry 500 kg when I don't know if I can carry 50 kg very well. He carried 500. If you see his muscles, he was abnormal in looks. But he took a training to come to that. And that was his passion in life. And you, you want to serve God. Will you submit to the yoke to prepare you to be able to bear God's body? See what we are pursuing now. The yoke that makes a man submissive. So many disciples are not submissive at all. When a man becomes submissive, he's yielded. 
is called to account and he happily does it. He appreciates the call to account. And not when you ask, let's have an account of what you are doing, your activities. Your first question is, is it, is it necessary? And I say, well, they will say, if it's not necessary, leave it. You don't want to render an account of your life. That is why you are eating uh, is it burger now or sandwich every day in the office. And your wife is managing to cook uh, in Salah. You know, in Salah is easiest now to cook with 1,000 naira. Something that is tasteless, as it were. Thank God for Maggie. Nobody calls you into account. You're living as you like. And you're already destroying your home. And for you, it looks normal. Praise the Lord. So you need to be under yoke to be completely accountable, to be responsible to somebody. The word submission is very, 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 very hard word. It's not just obedience. You know you can obey somebody and you've not submitted to the person. You take instructions and do what you're asked to do. But when it comes to submission, you have given up your own will and opinion. And you're allowing the will of God to prevail. Let me read Ephesians, I mean Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 17. Obey your spiritual leaders and submit to them, recognizing their authority over you. Hebrews 13 verse 17. Obey them and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls and continually guarding your spiritual welfare as those who will give an account of their stewardship of you. Let them do this with joy and not with grief and groans. For this will be of no benefit to you. So obey and submit. They are not the same thing. Submission has to do with recognizing authority. Coming under authority. Seeing the spiritual power and authority of a leader over your life. Spiritual authority is such a big, big concept. If you come under somebody's authority and you play with it, you will face some difficulties. A man who has authority over your life as a father can bless and curse you. Not everybody can bless and curse you. So you must recognize that authority. But obedience is, you can obey anybody who gives you instruction. However, it precedes submission. Somebody who will not obey anybody cannot submit. So don't deceive us. Say, I'm submitting to Brokesi. I'm under him. Whatever he says, he will do. But when another brother tells you something, say, leave it, forget about it. I will not do it. You don't obey anybody. And you are just pretending to be submitting to another. So the submission is a lifestyle. It flows naturally in a deposed opinion, in a life that is broken in, as we saw in Amplified. A life that is broken in. That's what the yoke achieves. It makes a man a broken person. If you are not a broken person, if you're opinionated and argumentative, you cannot submit to anybody. Grace flows in a broken life, a life that is yielded, or unopinionated, unargumentative. 
there is the power of life flowing through you that can change anybody. If they argue and seem to win a case and you're quiet, you make a point, by the end of that meeting, they will return to what you said. Because you didn't argue with them. You didn't need to be arguing with anybody. You are both obedient and submissive. Praise the Lord. So we'll be praying and trusting the Lord to help us come to a point we are content to be modeled. Are you content to be modeled? Or you want something else? Are you one of those who is saying discipleship is good, but you need to modify it and add some elements of uh, ministry in it? You know, some people are doing discipleship, and what they call discipleship is simply teaching people how to become ministers. Once you finish it, they will ordain you. And is it how many months? Eh? 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 Uh-uh. Okay, we know now. How many months? Eh? You don't know. I'm how many months? Those discipleship they do. Three months. Uh-huh. So after three months, is there a certificate course? They will give you a certificate and say you have become a disciple. You are discipled, and they open a parish for you. Three months. It's too short now. Eh? Is there any serious exam program you run for three months? Eh? Even Jesus did full-time discipleship. It's not uh, the one that we see once in a while. This one is full-time discipleship. Jesus knew his time was short and had to bring them into full-time discipleship. Their full-time ministry was, first of all, full-time discipleship. So they had to leave everything to be living with him. Imagine Jesus waking up and Peter is still snoring. And he said, Andrew, knock your brother. Wake him up. And Andrew saying, brother, brother. He said, knock your brother. Stop doing that. And Peter wakes up and says, which, which you told you to? He says, the master. Very careful. <laughs> Very careful. He said, the master wants you to wake up now. Eh? I don't know if you're getting me. So they were with him. He determined when they woke up. They began to learn his life. When he woke up himself, they wake up and say, the master too is awake. Whatever he was doing, they would start doing their own. That's how they learned his life. Why didn't he do his own for three months? Eh? He did his own three years and a half. He spent time. And uh, the snowballing effect of his own discipleship can amount to as much as 20 years when you go through t- making the way we are going now. God can subject you to 20 years of preparing you. So that in the end, I can look at my life and say, after these 20 years of being a disciple, I'm no longer having any sin in my life, one. That's what. Then number two, I'm now focused on the call of God of my life. How many of you can say that? No more sin. Eh? No more sin in your life. All the sin you battled with 10 years ago, they have left your life. Praise the Lord. Are you getting that? They have left your life. Your discipleship has succeeded. God now has a servant in you. Please don't go and do ministerial short course. You know, even the soldiers that undergo six months short course, they are not combatants. I you hope you know they are not combatants. And they have a limit of which they can arise. And the non-combatant cannot be chief of army staff. It's not possible. You have a limit. Maybe if you are if you are able to get a brigadier general, you end there.
if you want to be a combatant, you go like Ojuku and become a combatant, irrespective of your uh, other, all the benefits of education you have. You go and subject yourself to mutilating training. That somebody can slap you and you say, I did not take away my cheek from those who do what? Who smite? Eh? Who smite? Who pluck the beard and who smite the cheek? Is he not? That's discipleship. That's where submission comes. You want somebody to pluck your beard. It will not make sense to me now because I'm plucking my own. We are plucking our own. But for the Jew, if you don't have your beard well grown, something is wrong. If they shave it, you will stay in Jericho until they grow. Before you come back. You are a reproach. I don't know if you're getting me. So for us, in the spiritual perspective, we must allow men that take away that manliness from us. Handle us as if we are no men. Another man dictating for me, smiting my cheek, plucking my beard, subjecting me to corrections. How do you feel when your disciple says, go and kneel down and beg your husband you are wrong? You say, no, I don't think I'm wrong. You didn't understand me. They say, go and kneel down and beg. After two days, you have not met. I say, why? He say, I'm still trying to have a heart to do it the right way. He say, you must go and kneel down and beg. I say, I'm wrong. You know that will break your ego? Eh? As you do it, ego breaks. Or if I say, go and kneel down and apologize to your wife. Uh, I told one, one man of God, go and kneel down and apologize to your wife. Your wife was correct. You are wrong. <laughs> I said, go and go and you are wrong. You know that we break his ego. Eh? Yeah, you don't believe me again. Is it too harsh? <laughs> And that kind of uh, dealing is not something everybody bargains for. But do you see why homes are working? Do you know homes are working? Eh? You know our homes are working. If they are not working, we will not be bringing you here. There will be no need. The reason why they are working is that it's like somebody plugs the beach. Somebody smiles the cheek. But when you say, ah, when Diego Mkenota, as if you bought a, you bought a toy or something. Say, when Diego Mkenota, he has never apologized to. That it is wrong that the Bible says, man, a woman should submit to her husband. Teach her the right to submit to me. Anybody who is asking for submission is also not born again. Are you getting me? Are you getting me? Oh? Yes. When your life becomes correct, it commands respect. You don't demand it. You don't go asking for it. And say, let me give you a condition. Check this marriage, whether it will work. As if the marriage depends on you. Who brought the marriage? Is it not God? So it doesn't depend on you. you don't give anybody terms and conditions. We are praying that God will help you to be a man that is broken in. A man that his life has been crushed by God. A man that his cheek has been smitten. So that there will be hope. Let me summarize from lamentation. It is a cry that the man of God had to raise for the nation. Chapter 3. It is a long reading. Can you read from verse 19? Remember my affliction. 
and my wardrobe. The warm wood. 19 to 30, eh? The warm wood and bitterness. Show me my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness. Do you have hope? Lamentations 3, verse 19. Do you have hope? If a man has a hope that revival is coming, that divine visitation will not fail, he submits to the yoke. Continue. The Lord's loving kindness <coughs> never ceases, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. They are new every morning. Great is, Great your, is faithfulness. your faithfulness. The Lord we sing this song all the time, Abby. We get a perspective of this song. Our hope of revival drives us. A disciple must show a drive while a disciple must draw. But if you are not driving, if there is no intent on pursuing this program of God, you cannot be a disciple actually. Continue. Lord is my portion. Is my portion says, my soul. says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. I have hope. I have hope. It's my portion. My portion is not messages Benz. My portion is not anything physical. And let me not lose that focus that the Lord is my portion. All right, continue. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. Yes, sir. The person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. It is now look good. at verse 27. It is good for a man that he should bear the yoke. That's where we are going to be rounding off our discussion tonight. It is good for a man to bear the yoke when he's young. Are you young now? The best time to be in discipleship is when you are young enough. It helps you. When you are starting discipleship at a very old age, you may not be able, to, unless you want to do the three month kind of a discipleship. If you are doing the real discipleship, you may just be ending in discipleship and you are close to grave. You are not able to even do anything. So if you are young now, take your decision to submit to discipleship. Let him sit alone in hope and keep quiet because God has laid it on him for his benefit. Who is the one that puts a yoke on a man? God. It is God, though. So stop seeing human being. Stop seeing a labor team. Stop saying, oh, is, is this peace house people that have come to disturb everybody? There is nothing again you are hearing any every time discipleship, discipleship. We are waiting, they will soon be tired. You know some people are waiting. Say so we are waiting, they will soon be tired. Now we talk about something else. Because they think it is human beings that introduce the yoke. But God say it is God who has laid the yoke on a man. So let him put his mouth to the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him. Let him be filled with reproach, for the Lord will not reject forever. Praise the Lord. Let him, let him, let him. Who will do it? You are the one. Anytime you keep saying, my disciple is not uh, prompting me. I see responsibility put on me as a disciple now. To pursue the yoke and put my mouth to the dust. Stop talking. You are talking too much. Stop talking. Put your mouth to the dust. 
and allow this phase of your life to take effect. Allow men to strike you. Stop dodging this mighty. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Stop uh, evading it. Anytime they come, you are smart. You say of our discipleship. Anyway, they follow. You follow the other way. Who is deceiving who? You are deceiving yourself now. God is involved. It is God who has laid it on him. For a man's hope to be sustained, there must be a yoke. For a man's pursuit of God's visitation, not to be lost. Do you know so many have lost their own? People who were with you in school. They pursued a life of godliness and sanctification. And now they have gone back to the world again. If you see them on the Facebook, your heart will break, is it not? So what has happened to this girl? Or what has happened to this boy? They have lost the hope of his coming. Your own can be lost also if there is no yoke of discipleship on your neck. So I want us to pray at this point. I want us to pray again and I trust the Lord to help us on this matter. I hope you note the burdens of our uh, sharing tonight. I hope you are ready to sit close, sit down and stay close and be submitted to the yoke. Bro Mike, can you take the closing prayer? Let's pray again and beg the Lord. Let somebody be able to say to God tonight, I will no longer protest in the yoke. I'm going to stay in it. Let's pray tonight. <laughs>